privilege to share God's word with you guys today. And uh, excited for the retreat that's about to come. And I've been praying and preparing for it, asking for the Lord to bless us as we gather near Him to worship Him. And especially uh, as we tackle the topic of corporate worship, as we tackle the elements of worship and what it means for the body of Christ to gather together to worship God, uh, I hope that He would uh, really use this time to renew our minds and help us to worship Him in spirit and truth. So, amen? Amen to that? Amen. Yeah? Okay. Um, today, Pastor Ted actually asked me if I could speak on the topic of um, community of this idea of like being one body in Christ and when he brought up that topic I think my mind uh, automatically went to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 so if you guys have your Bibles turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and I wanted to read for us verses 12 to 20, 27 verses 12 to 27 and I want to see what God's word has to say about what it means to be uh, in community with one another right uh, what does it mean uh, for this group right here to conduct relationships with each other in a way that honors Jesus Christ, in a way that glorifies God. So we want God to give us direction on uh, from His Word. We want to follow Him rather than our own thoughts. We want to do what He says rather than what the world tells us. So um, we want to see what the Bible has to say regarding that. And my hope and prayer that after we're done uh, studying through this passage is that a lot of the principles from this passage will now be lived out in the relationships that we have uh, here in our church and here in the English ministry. So uh, that's what we're going to do today, okay? So Matthew, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 12 to 27, here's the reading of God's holy word. So let me read this for us. <clears throat> for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Amen. Um, so 1 Corinthians is actually a very, very encouraging book for me as a pastor. And the reason why is no matter uh, whatever problems I face in the church that I serve at, I always think to myself, there is a church with greater problems than the church that I serve at. And that church is called the Corinthian church. That's how I would always comfort myself. So anytime I was serving and I would say, ah, oh, we have problems here, we have problems here, we have problems here, and I would fall into despair or discouragement, God would always encourage me and say, well, at least you're not pastoring the Corinthian church, right? Because this church was a mess. Um, People were sleeping with prostitutes. There was adultery going on. People were so angry at one another and so mad at each other that they would sue each other and take each other to court. Uh, people didn't know how to celebrate the Lord's Supper well, so God was like killing them. I mean, this church was a mess, right? There were some people in the church that basically said there was no resurrection, right? So Jesus didn't, uh, Jesus died, but that he didn't resurrect from the, uh, the grave. So I don't know. I'm imagining anytime the church saying about the resurrection of Christ, they were just like, nope. 
I'm not singing that because that's not true. And then Paul would look at them and say stuff like, why are you even coming to church? Like, why do you call yourself a Christian when Jesus is still dead, right? Uh, there was divisions in the church where it was like, you know, people said, you know what? I follow Pastor Paul. Other body, uh, somebody else said, I follow Pastor Apollos. Other body, uh, other body, somebody was like, I follow Pastor Peter, right? And anytime someone was nice to them and cared for them, they were like, this is the guy that I'm going to listen to. And instead, I'm not going to listen to anybody else. So there was like massive division, like massive division in the church, right? So if you, um, I was reading 1 Corinthians as I was preparing for this sermon, and almost every single chapter, Paul points out a problem. 16 chapters of 1 Corinthians, literally, the Corinthian church, I want to argue, had 16 problems right? 16 chapters, 16 problems. But what's really, really interesting about this book is this. Out of all the problems that the Corinthian church struggled with, right? The, the concept, right? The concept of unity and the concept of division, which is kind of two sides of the same coin, was something that the Apostle Paul visited constantly throughout the book of 1 Corinthians. So he didn't just talk about it once, but he talked about it multiple times. He talked about it in the beginning of his book, and then 12 chapters later, he revisits it again, which seems to suggest, which seems to suggest that this idea of division in the body of Christ was something that the Corinthian church struggled with a lot. Paul says in chapters 1 all the way to chapters 4, he's like, you guys struggle with division. You guys are not united. You guys are not one body, right? God wants to give you guys wisdom, but he can't because you guys are fleshly. And the reason why you guys are so fleshy and natural and unspiritual is because you guys are divided. Because you guys follow human leaders rather than Jesus. And you would think that's it, right? But then you fast forward to chapter 12 and he's like, you guys are divided. You guys are not united. You, you know, you, you ever have parents? My mom, like she, like she would always repeat the same things to me, you know? Like, she, like you know, like, like she would be like, you know, she would be like, weather's nice, but you need to study harder, right? And then like five minutes later, she goes, you know, what do you want for the, you need to study harder. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, geez, mom, like I get it. I, I, like, how many times do you have to tell me, right? And I said to myself, when I had kids, I'm not going to do that. You know what I say to my kids now? Hey, you need to study harder. <laughs> right? And Paul's doing the same thing. As a spiritual father to the Corinthian church, Paul's basically like, man, why are you guys so divided? Why is there no unity here? How come you guys don't love each other? Right? Why do you guys follow different leaders? Why do you guys honor one leader more than another leader? Right? Why are you guys like thinking like one person is more important than another person and he just keeps talking about it over and over and over again in the book of 1 Corinthians? And what amazes me is I feel like as I'm reading 1 Corinthians, there's other sins that seem greater to me that Paul doesn't emphasize as much as this idea of division and unity. Right? Because I don't know about you guys, right? But sexual sin, to me, to me, I could be wrong, but sexual sin, to me, seems like a greater problem, right? Seems like a greater problem. But Paul talks about it, but it seems like Paul talks about this idea of unity and division even more, right? Um, oh, isn't that working? Oh, shoot, sorry. Okay. Hello? Now I know who to blame if the sermon goes wrong now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so think about it now, right? So here's the thing. As we go into what God's word has to say, right? Is your value of unity in this community just as important as God's idea of unity in this community, right? Do you value unity here just as much as God values unity, okay? Because it seems like in 1 Corinthians, God values it a lot, okay? So let's go into that. So in chapters 11 to 14, Paul kind of talks about very similar things. In chapter 11, he talks about proper behavior and worship. 
So, you know, he's like, man, you know, when you guys celebrate the Lord's Supper, some of you guys rush on ahead of each other, right? Some people eat too much, others starve, and you guys are not doing with the right heart and right spirit. And then Paul says something crazy, and he goes, that's why some of you guys are sick, and that's why some of you guys are dying, <laughs> right? Isn't that crazy? You do the Lord's Supper, and then you die. And then Paul's like, you know why? You know why God is killing you? Because he's showing you grace, because he's killing you now so that you won't go to hell. <laughs> Can you imagine the Corinthian church hearing that? Right? God is killing you, and that's grace. So he could save you. Right? Chapter 12, the chapter that we're going to cover, he talks about the idea of how there's many different gifts, but it's all for the unity of the body. Chapter 13, he basically says, all these gifts are useless unless we have love. And then in chapter 14, he tackles these very controversial gifts called prophecy and tongues because the Corinthians are not using it well, okay? So today, we're going to focus on chapter 12, and we're going to see what God's Word has to say regarding 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I think what I notice is this, is in verses 12 to 14, Paul uh, holds two things in tension. And the two things that he holds in tension is unity and diversity. So he basically says this. He says, when you look at a Christian community, when you look at a church, okay? So basically, Paul's basically like, when you look at a church like this, when you look at OCCEC, right? OCCEC, right? He basically says this. He goes, this church is different, yet this church is one. So he doesn't ignore the problem, okay? But he also emphasizes the solution. So the thing that I want to uh, emphasize to you is this is, although Paul acknowledges the diversity, he emphasizes and he stresses the unity, okay? He acknowledges the diversity, but he emphasizes and stresses the unity. Look at verse 12. Paul says something like this. He says, look, there's so many of us and he goes, and we're all different. So that's what he says. He goes, look, there's all these different people, and we're all different, we're all diverse. But then he says this. He goes, but we are one. But we are one. Look at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. You guys see that? You guys see the way he plays with the words? He goes, look, we're all different, there's many of us, we're all diverse, however, we are one. Okay? Look at verse 13 now. Paul says, and then he's, he's kind of like making it even more specific. He goes, not only are there many of us, he says, we are significantly different. We are so different from each other. However, he says this, but we're one. And the reason why we're one is because of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Look at verse 13. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free. Now, you see those words, Jews or Greeks, slave or free? They never hung out together. They were never in the same community. And if they were in the same community, they hated it, right? You put a Jew and a Greek in the same room, their main thought was, how do I get out of this room, right? You put a slave and a free person in the same room, their thought was, how do I get out of this room? Right? So Paul's like, look how significantly different this body is. However, it's one body. And then everybody's like, how the heck did this body become one body? And then the, uh, Paul says, it all happened because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who put all of us into one body. Now here's the lesson that Paul's trying to make to the Corinthian church. And this is the lesson that I would want you to know is this. Paul acknowledges diversity. So he does doesn't hide the problem he doesn't ignore the problem okay Does, do you know people who like you talk about the problem and they're like hey I don't want to focus on that I don't want to think about it right you know those people where like there's a mess you know like like you know uh, the bathroom's broken uh, this, uh, just don't think about it right do you know people like that right Paul Paul's not like that 
Paul's like, look, there is a problem. And the problem is, there's Jews and Greeks, slave and free, hanging out in one church, in one room, that's causing all these problems, right? And it's because of diversity, it's because of differences, and I want to acknowledge it. I want to acknowledge that. However, Paul says this, he goes, that's not what I'm going to emphasize. That's not what I'm going to stress. Although I acknowledge diversity, I'm going to emphasize and stress unity. You guys see the difference there, right? And that was the problem of the Corinthian church because you know what the Corinthian church did? They stressed and emphasized diversity over unity. Okay? The Corinthian church, they said, look how different we are. We're not the same, right? Look how different we are. I'm a Jew, he's a Greek. I'm free, he's a slave. I follow Paul, he follows Apollos. And they just kept stressing the differences. They kept stressing the diversity rather than emphasizing the unity. And Paul says, that's not the way you're supposed to think. Let me tell you what to think. The way you're supposed to think is, although you acknowledge diversity, we have to emphasize and stress unity. Okay? Is that you? Let me ask you a question today. When you think about this church, right? When you think about your community, do you emphasize unity or do you emphasize diversity? Because whatever you emphasize, it will have an effect. It's going to have an effect. Whatever you emphasize, it's going to have an effect. Whatever you emphasize, it's going to work its way into your heart. Okay? All right. Um, you know, I remember I was, I, was going, I was going to get extra schooling, so I graduated from seminary, and then maybe like five years later, I said, you know, I think I need more schooling to be a better pastor. So I wanted to get out of California. So I said, I don't want to go to school in California. And I started looking around for a uh, school. I started looking around for school. And then I found a school in Florida. And I said, I want to go to this uh, Christian school in Florida to get extra uh, schooling. And then I went there. And I was shocked, man. Because it was a class of 30 people. And I was the only Asian. <laughs> okay? I was, and you got to understand, I grew up in Orange County. Right? This is so comforting to me right here. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like I, I came in, I sat down, and I was like, ah. Like, you know, like I felt the spirit of, not the Holy Spirit, but the spirit of Richard saying, you're home. Right? I went to Florida, and it's all, okay, I'm sorry. It was all white people, right? And I remember I sat there, and only thing I could think about was this. Only thing I could think about it's all white people. Like in my head, right? I'm like smiling, you know? And in my head, it's like, oh, it's all white people. It's all white people. It's all white people. And I'm like, no, 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 it's okay. And I was talking to myself, like, it's okay. You know white people, Richard? Right? And then they started talking. And they're all from Louisiana. <laughs> right? Mississippi. And I'm like, oh my goodness. These are southern white people. <laughs> right? And I was the youngest one there. They're all in their 50s and 60s. And one man, genuine, genuine man, he goes, hey boy, what's your name? And I said, oh my goodness, this white person from the south called me boy. <laughs> <laughs> and I kid you not, that first day, I distanced myself. Right? After class, you know after class, like, you all kind of like, you know, hey, what's up, how's it going, you know, like, like, you know? They all gathered, and I just sat there by myself, right? And I bet some of them were like, Asian. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept highlighting it. That night I called my wife, and she's like, hey, how's it going? I said, oh my gosh, it's all white people. Not just white people, but white people from the South. And I said, this person called me a boy. Right? I mean, right? It's, it's crazy. 
Second day, I'm like, you know what? Ugh, you can't be like this. So I said, I'm gonna go hang out with them. I said, hi, right? How's it going? They're like, hey, where are you from? I'm like, oh, and I said, I'm from California. I'm the only guy from California, right? And they're like, they're like, you must be liberal, right? They're like, you must be liberal, right? And I'm like, I had to defend myself. I said, no, I'm not liberal, <laughs> right? And then they were like, you know, let's go eat. I said, we went to eat. We went to get barbecue. And then they're like, they're like, you know, they're like, they ordered this thing called okra. I've never heard of that in my life, right? And all I could think about was like, oh my God, we even like different food, right? Second day, second day. And then you know what really just convicted me? I was talking to one of my friends. He's another pastor. And then I was like, you know, she's like, he's like, hey, how's it going there? How's it going? And then I was like, oh, you know, it's okay, but you know, like, they're so different from me. That's what I kept saying. They're so different from me. They're so different from me. And then he, he, he said to me over the phone, he was like, hey, are they Christian? And I'm like, yeah, well, duh. They're all pastors. And then he's like, hey, last time I checked, weren't they your brothers and sisters? And I felt like the spirit of God just like, you know, like, you know, those spiritual swords that's like, you know, like stabs me. And I felt like the spirit of God was like, hey, Richard, like, these are your brothers. Like your real brothers. Like Jesus actually said that these brothers might be even closer than your physical brothers. And the Spirit of God was telling me, like, what are you emphasizing here? Are you emphasizing the differences? Or are you emphasizing the similarities? And I literally had to get on my knees and I had to repent because I was emphasizing the differences. It worked its way into my heart and I distanced myself from the group. You guys see that? And then, you know, afterwards, I made a commitment to emphasize the similarities. So I remember I walked in, I said, these are my brothers, these are my brothers, these are my brothers, right? And I started drawing near to them. I started spending more time with them. And I kid you not, to this day, my closest friend, my closest friend from that group is the most different from me. This guy's from the deep south, man. He's never been to the city, right? He's like 70 years old, right? Like, I can't even understand if he speaks English because his southern twang is so like thick, right? This guy named Mike, we still hang out today, right? He says I'm the only Asian he's ever met in his life. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, this is, he always says, this is my Asian friend. And he goes, this is one of my closest friends. You, get, you see how whatever you emphasize works its way into your heart? Whatever you emphasize. So you know what Paul's doing here? Paul is basically saying, right, what are you emphasizing, although you acknowledge the difference, right? So are you emphasizing the faults of the church, right? Or the strengths of the church? Because I know this, my old church, the people that emphasized the faults of the church, they left the church after a while. They did, you know why? Because they just, it worked its way into the heart, right? Are you emphasizing the faults of somebody else or the strengths of somebody else? Right? Cut. Why? Because everybody I know, like, you know what? I talk to people and they're like, oh, that guy, problem, 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 problem. You know what? They're never close. Never close. So that's one of the problems of division in the Corinthian church was, although they acknowledge unity, yeah, 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 we're one. They emphasize diversity or differences, while Paul basically says, you gotta flip it around. And my prayer for you, OCC, OCCEC, is that you emphasize unity while you acknowledge diversity. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Yeah, okay. All right, uh, here's my second point. Paul addresses two errors, two er two, so two bad thinking that the Corinthian church had, okay? 
And the first error is this. The church does not need me. The body does not need me. Okay? So that was the first error. So there were people in the Corinthian church that was basically, they looked at the church and they were like, oh, it doesn't need me. Like, I'm not needed. I'm not that important. Look at verse 15 and 16. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So background of the Corinthian church, uh, it was a very gifted church. In fact, in chapter one, Paul was like, man, you guys are so gifted. Like it was so, like, care, like, you know, prophecy, healing, like, you know, like all the gifts, it's like tongues, like full display, right? Super gifted church. And what happened was the people with the gifts of prophecy and healing and tongues, um, it made the ones who didn't have those gifts feel inferior, right? Uh, you ever feel that way where, you know, like your brother and sister, you just feel like they just have a greater gift than you, right? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, you have a gift, but their gift is like, Whoa! you know, like, like it's crazy, right? You ever feel that? And then what happens? You feel inferior, Right. Like, you know, like uh, I, I just read a statistic that said like the oldest sibling is always the smartest. Right. Like it sucks for the second one then. Right. Or the third one. Right. Like, you know, like 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 siblings struggle with inferiority complexes. Right. Because like, you know, like uh, I know I know one family where the oldest went to Harvard and the second one went to UCI. Now, UCI is not a bad school. Right. That's all right. <laughs> one of you guys like, <laughs> but the brother went to Harvard. So the one that went to UCI, inferiority complex, right? I mean, they still went to college. So, you know, it's like the parent, and then, you know, the parents are not cool, you know, because the parents were like, you know, oh, my son went to Harvard and UCI. <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? So that's going on in the Corinthian church. So there's envy, there's discouragement, there's discontentment, and there's division. Uh, do you feel this way? So basically they're like, oh, I'm not needed, right? Oh, you know this gift of, this, this, uh, the, the guy with the prophetic gifts, oh, the church really needs that. Oh, the gift with healing, oh, the church really needs that. Oh, the gift of tongues, oh, the church really needs that. But uh, I just have the gift of help. Uh, you know, like, uh, they could do it without it. Oh, I have the gift of administration. Oh, you know, they could do it without it. So they were feeling that way, right? And, and my question to you is, do you feel that way? Like, uh, how do you know, right? Does anybody sitting here today feel unappreciated or underappreciated, right? I'm serving so hard, I'm sacrificing so much, I'm giving so much, and I just feel like underappreciated, right? I feel overlooked. I remember at my old church, when we selected leaders, one guy actually came up to me and he was like, I break my back, I've been here forever, I serve so hard, I give so much, and you picked him who came to church three years ago over me when I've been here 10 years? And, and, you know, I, I actually thanked him because I was like, you know, usually if someone thinks that, I don't even know. I said, hey, thanks. Thanks for even letting me know. Right? Like, do you feel like an outsider? Or do you feel dispensable? You know what I'm saying? Like, um, I know people who wake up on Sunday, Sunday and they don't want to come to church. And they're like, you know, oh yeah, I don't have to come to church, you know? Like, no one's gonna miss me. This, this is the bad thinking. This is the error that Paul's addressing here, right? So what does Paul say? Paul actually says multiple things. You know, the first thing he says is this. He's so funny, right? I, I always laugh when he does this kind of stuff. He goes, even if you think this way, feel this way, or say this, that doesn't mean it's true. So that's how he starts. So if you said that to Paul, he'll be like, uh, you're wrong. Right? Look at verse 15 and 16. He says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, right? So, you know, that's the wrong thinking. Here's Paul's answer. That would not make it any less a part of the body. Right? He goes, just because you think that doesn't mean it's true. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
Yeah, I know you don't feel needed, but it's not true, right? I know you feel dispensable, it's not true, right? Like, I know you feel like an outsider, it's not true. And then Paul says, every part is needed and plays a function because God sovereignly ordained it that way. He's like, whether you feel needed or not, you have a part. And that part is because God, in his sovereignty, placed you there for his good purpose, his glory, and his reason. Look at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? Because all the ears want to be an eye. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? All the ears want to be a nose, right? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. That's sovereignty just like powerfully coming out. God, why did you put me in this body? I don't even feel that important. And God is like, I put you here because I chose you to be here because you have a part here. Verse 19, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. You guys see that? You have a purpose here, a godly purpose. You have a part, right? You play a function. And without you, the body cannot be healthy. Without you, the body cannot be healthy. And I'm not talking about the people that are like out in the front, right? Because we know their necessity, right? We know their necessity. So I'm not trying to downplay that, right? Like, like you know, like Pastor Ted, we know his necessity. If Pastor Ted's not here, it's over, right? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like leaders, like, you know, we know your necessity. We're talking about the people that don't think they're ne uh, necessary. And God is saying, just as the people we think are necessary, the people we don't think are necessary are necessary. And will we believe God's word over what Satan says to us or over what, uh, um, what we think of ourselves? You guys see that, right? Okay. Now, I know some of us are like, well, why did God give greater gifts to some people? Right? Like, like, like how, come, how come I don't have this gift? Why do I have this gift? How come, you know, why did God give greater gifts to someone else? You know why? Let me give you, the, let me give you one answer. Because for God, our value or what he thinks about us doesn't come from the gifts that he gives us. Okay? Now that's a thought that I want you guys to know. The gifts that God has given you has nothing to do with what God thinks about you. Okay? You know what God thinks about you? He gave you Jesus. He gave Jesus to everyone. That's what God thinks about you. Your value and your worth doesn't come from your gifts, but your value and your worth come from Jesus. And although every single person here has different gifts, every single person here has Jesus. So every single person here is loved by God. Can I get an amen on that? And so you got to stop. You got to stop thinking about the fact that your worth comes from your gifts because it doesn't. Your worth comes from Christ and everybody has Christ here. Everybody. Although the gifts that God has given is different. And that is something that we have to fight to believe because if we don't believe that, then we're going to have an inferiority complex and it's going to cause us to leave the church or not play our function because we feel like God loves someone else more than us and that is not true. You guys see that there? Okay. Um, you know, usually, like, you know, I have, like, uh, not usually, but I have, I, I don't know, whatever, it's okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm talking to myself. Okay. Uh, there's this one guy at my, uh, at my church, at my old church, and he was a leader. Like, he was one of our main leaders, right? And um, I planted a church 13 years ago. He started the church with me, right? Faithful service. I mean, you want to talk about faithful servant? This dude is a faithful servant, right? And then church started to grow, right? Church started to grow. And then uh, we hired an associate pastor, right? Because church started to grow. So we hired an associate pastor. And, you know, uh, we're thinking about, oh, what role should we give this associate? What role should we give this associate, right? And we start thinking about like, oh, we should give him this role, this role, this role. And you know, because an associate, our associate was full-time, we're like, 
like he needs he needs full time work. Like we can't just call, pay him pay him full time and then give him like you know part time work. So we're like, oh, we should give. But you know, like when you're like when the church is like when you start with one pastor, right? Like it's like the lay people are like serving a lot, you know. So this associate now needs some of the work of the lay people, right? So, you know, we're like, oh, shoot, like, um, you know, he needs this and this and this. And what we realized was he needed this guy's job, right? But this guy, he loved his job, you know? Like, like he loved it and he was good at it. Think about it, right? He loved it and he was good at it. But we were like, oh, we should give him this job because, you know, like, he's, he's getting paid for it. And then I was like, I've never done this before. I've never taken away a role from somebody that liked it and was good at it, right? I was scared because I thought he was going to be like hurt. I thought he was going to be offended, right? And I'm like, oh, no, we shouldn't do it. And then, you know, we're like, no, but what's he going to do? And I almost was like, ah, don't hire him. Like, that's how, like, you know? And I remember we had the meeting with this guy and uh, I was like, hey, you know, like, you're doing a great job. Great leader. We know you love it. Thank you for all your service. And then we were like, we're taking away your role. Because we're going to give it to him. And he was like, oh, like, you know, like, shocked, right? And then afterwards he goes, okay. And I was like, are you sure? He goes, yeah. I was like, no, 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 no. Are you sure? He goes, yeah. And I was like, ah, oh, passive aggressive. Right? He says, yeah, later on, five months later, he's going to leave the church. Right? I was like, are you really sure? He goes, yeah. And he goes, hey, I'll help the associate transition. And that's what he did. It was amazing. Like, <laughs> it's so funny. I'm not surprised by sin, but I'm shocked by godliness sometimes, you know? <laughs> right? He, like, transitioned him in. And then I was like, oh, he's probably not going to serve as hard now, you know? Oh, he's probably not going to, like, you know? He's probably just going to, like, do his own thing. The guy served even harder. To a point where we actually nominated him as an elder recently. Right? And then I actually, like, several years later, I, like, I was sitting with him and I was talking with him and I was like, hey, man, like, were you okay when we asked you to, like, you know? Like when we took away all these things from you. And then he was like, well, to be honest, like I really liked what I was doing. And he was like, and I kind of felt like, you know, like I wasn't needed. But then he was like, uh, I was talking with my wife and talking with my friends and I was praying. And then he said, I realize that I love this church and I realize that my worth comes from Jesus more than what I do. I was like, wow, that's so amazing. Right? And, and that's my prayer for you. That's my prayer for you. That you could find your worth in the gospel more than what you do so that now you're able to serve with the freedom of the spirit. Amen? Yeah. Like all the servants should be free. Like, you guys should be free. You serve in a free way. And that's where I think God wants us to get to. Second error. I don't need the body. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So, uh, this is the flip side, which is, the gifted ones saw other people as less important or unnecessary. So this is like the flip side. Like the less gifted ones were like, oh, no one needs me. Um, the gifted ones were like, oh, I don't need them. Like they're unnecessary. Like, like we don't really need them, right? So, you know, it's kind of like, I think one of the questions is, who do, who do we think are unnecessary? Who do we think are dispensable? Who do we think are not that important? You know how you know? By not paying attention to them by not caring for them, not, by not acknowledging them, right? You can totally tell, you walk into any church, you can tell, totally tell who are the dispensable ones, right? By, by the lack of care, 
lack of attention, lack of focus, lack of emphasis, right? You could totally tell. It could be children, it could be young people, it could be old people, it could be outsiders, right? Most churches, it's the awkward ones. Most churches. Most churches, it's the ones who don't fit in. Most churches, it's the weirdos. Most churches is the ones that don't fit the culture of the church. Most churches. Where you kind of just distance yourself from them. Because like it's uncomfortable, right? And what's really interesting is Paul says something like this. He goes, yeah, like, you know, like the unpresentable parts. You don't want to look at that. It's uncomfortable. Right? It's, it's uncomfortable. So who are uncomfortable? Right? Maybe like, like let's say like, you meet somebody and you realize they were, they were divorced. It's uncomfortable, right? Like, maybe you realize like, somebody doesn't have a parent. They live with their uncle. It's uncomfortable, right? Maybe you realize like, this person's very, very poor. It's uncomfortable, right? Like. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, this person has like a mental illness. Very uncomfortable. Right? And, and Paul's basically saying like, yeah, it's, it's the people you think are very uncomfortable. Like, you know, it's not that you like kick them out with like pitchforks and torches, but you kick them out through like withdrawing from them because it's very uncomfortable. It's awkward. Right, like, like Asians, we love this word, right? It's awkward. Oh, it's so awkward. Oh, that was so awkward talking to him. <laughs> right? You know what Paul says? This is what Paul says. Paul says, you know those people that are super uncomfortable? They're actually indispensable. <laughs> Look at verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Like, you need them. Like, okay, I think what Paul's arguing here is if everybody's comfortable with everybody, you're not a good church. Yeah. Like, if everybody loves everybody and everybody's super comfortable with everybody and there's like, you know, like, like this perfect, like, comfort, something's really wrong. Like, something is really wrong. Like if I was a church consultant and you guys were like, oh my God, we, you know, all of us, we hang out together. All of us, we love each other. All of us, we get along perfectly with each other. I'll be like, okay, I have two choices here. Number one, we're, I, I've somehow been transported to heaven. Or number two, something's really wrong. Because there should be a level of discomfort in the church for 1 Corinthians 12 to work. You guys see what I'm talking about? Right? And then Paul says in verse 23, those with less honor, we are to give greater honor. Like, like, the, like the ones that you find awkward, uncomfortable, right? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, let's say like, you know, I don't know, somebody completely different from the culture of your church walked in. Like you're supposed to, you're supposed to give them greater honor. Verse 23, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty. You guys see that? You're supposed to give greater honor. I would love, I would love for like people that has no connection with the culture of this church walk in and be like, man, I feel so loved here. I feel so loved here, right? You know why? You know why Paul is arguing for this? Two reasons, two reasons, okay? Two reasons from the text. Number one is this. The purpose of the church, right? The purpose of the church is to not love those who love us, but to love those who we don't think we need. Can I get an amen on that? The purpose of the church is not to love those who love us. Uh, you know, there's this like sickness going around in Southern California where everybody's looking for a church that fits them. That's, that's unbiblical, right? You know why? Because the early church loved people who they thought they didn't need. You know who the early church loved? Early church loved widows, orphans, poor, the slave, and the outcast. <laughs> 
that's what the church was filled with. Widows, slaves, orphans, the uh, poor and the outcast. And you know why? Look at verse 24. Verse 24 says this. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So God, God's basically saying this. He's basically saying, hey, give honor to the people who have no honor because God gave honor to the people who had no honor. And church, this is the gospel. Because every single one of us sitting here today has God given us honor when we deserve no honor? Right? We were all sinners. We did not deserve honor from God. We wanted dishonor from God. We, we deserve dishonor from God. But yet, God took the unpresentable parts of our sin, the weakness of our flesh, and He nailed it on the cross. And he gave us honor when we deserved dishonor. And God says, because God has given us honor when we deserved no honor, go now and give honor to those people who have no honor. So when Jesus says this in John, when the church is now united, the world will know that God has sent his son. You know why we think so highly of ourselves? Because we don't understand the gospel. Here's my last point. You see, the problem of division, right, is because everybody thinks this. Oh, church doesn't need me or I don't need the church. Look at verse 25, 26. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. You know why there's division? Because we emphasize the wrong thing. Right? We care for the wrong people. And we give honor to the wrong people. Right? But you know why there's division? Here's the main problem. So much comparing. So much comparing. We compare so much. You don't even know you're comparing. Like you, you know, like, you know how you know you do it so much? You don't even know you're doing it. Right? Like, it's become, like, like, unconscious. The Corinthians, you know what their biggest problem was? They compared so much. They compared themselves to each other so much. Right? Now, it's okay to compare, actually. But... Most people compare themselves to the wrong things. We should stop comparing ourselves to others. But instead, we need to compare ourselves to God's holiness. Right? We need to compare ourselves to God's grace. God gave those gifts, not because he loves us more, not because he thinks higher of us. God gave us gifts to build up the body of Christ. It's grace. It's grace. And I think when we, as a church, begin to compare ourselves to the right things, only then will humility reign and unity begin. So let me recap. My exhortation to you today is this. Emphasize and stress the right things. Unity over diversity. Don't find your worth in your gifts or what people think about you, but in the fact that you have Jesus. Remember the honor that God gave you when you deserve no honor and give honor to others, especially the ones that don't deserve honor. And compare yourselves to the right things, which is not to each other, but instead to the holiness of God and the grace of God. Amen? Yeah. So... May the word of God um, reside deeply in your heart. My prayer for you will be that the spirit would water it so that it would grow into good fruit. So that hopefully, when I come back for the retreat, and if you don't invite me after this, I totally understand, right? <laughs> right? Hopefully, by the spirit of God, that you would have the right mindset 
to be a united church in Jesus Christ for the glory of God. Amen? Yeah, that's my prayer for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you, OC, C E C. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll get it right. I'll, I'm going to keep saying it every day. I'm praying for you. I actually, I'm praying for you almost every day, I think. Yeah. I'm praying for you almost every day. Yeah. Especially for worship and for unity. Right? So I'm praying for you guys almost all the time. Okay? So please pray for me. Yeah. But um, I know God will bless this church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your grace, your mercy. We pray for unity here, that God would show his grace and mercy upon us. We pray that you would bless OCCEC to emphasize the right things, that they are one because of the spirit of God, that you would help them to have the right mindset that everybody is needed and especially the ones that we think are weaker should be given greater honor. Help us to stop comparing to each other but as we compare ourselves to your holiness we realize how amazing and magnificent your grace becomes. So thank you. Unite this church in Jesus Christ. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kim, for your message.